And uh, everyone is back to this homegrown radicalization that could be a major focus of this particular event. American Islamic Forum for Democracy founder Zudi Jesser on that. A, a couple of things stand out and what we're learning right now about Salman Abedi. Uh, one is that he was born to parents of Libyan birth, the second youngest of four children. Uh, he was on the British Security uh, Services radar for at least upwards of the past year. Thought to have returned from Libya, and they knew about that as recently as this week, uh, just days before the attack. Uh, I could go on and on, but again, um, this is part of a tight-knit Libyan community, uh, many of whom settled in Manchester right after the overthrow of Gaddafi. But what are you connecting there as, as we're connecting that here? Well, I think for national security's sake, we need to look at the commonalities. Every one of these narratives, Neil, ends up being a known wolf, ends up having some travel history. Uh, we hear that his mother was teaching him the Quran. We hear that he went to the mosque, got more religious in the weeks, months before. Uh, he got upset that his imam was critical of ISIS. A lot of these things are common of what we heard with the Boston bombers, with Chattanooga, with San Bernardino. Uh, but the bottom line is, Neil, is that we get distracted if we look too much into the branches of the tree, we need to step back and look at the forest. The forest is that there, there are ideological precursors before they become operational jihadis. He might have become an operational jihadi and learned how to put on the suicide belt, how to make it in Syria or in Libya. But before that, what took him there was a community, a culture that taught him, and that radicalized him, that the West was the problem. The, he is a victim in the West, that the conspiracy theories of the West created this tyrants in the Middle East. All of these types of ideologies put forth by Islamist organizations fueled by petro-Islamic ideology across the world is the radicalization pathway. And until we stop just spending billions, Neil, on that last step, trying to find them before they put on the suicide belt, and by the way, we did find him. He was a known wolf, not a lone wolf, known. We ignore all the previous steps. We need a cultural revolution against this theocratic ideology that's brewing inside our countries. But do we know, for example, or, or the, the, whether his own community knew uh, he might have violent tendencies, or do they protect their own? Well, odds are they probably uh, uh, would have reported it, most of them, if they knew that he had violent tendencies, but that's just the last step. Uh, now, having said that, remember the Paris attacks in November 15, that same cell, and this is probably why London uh, and Britain is still on a high imminent alert, is because, remember, that same cell in Paris committed an act in Brussels uh, four months later in March 2016, so there's probably still parts that they, they might be protected within families, within yeah. close networks, but the majority of the Muslim community would report him if he was expressing any type of violence, well, I hope et you're right. I'll take your word on that, but, but I don't know. Uh, one of the things I do know is that a, a lot of the attacks we have had here are, are of the homegrown variety. In other words, uh, those who might have sympathy and have been radicalized abroad or here, uh, but, are, but, but are recognized as citizens here or here legally through visas and the like. So are we chasing the wrong boogeyman by going after ISIS elements abroad? We need to do both. It's a military problem abroad in Syria and Iraq. It is an ideological, cultural, global revolution for modernization, reform of Islam, a, a coming to terms with modernity, just like we did. Think Cold War. Think global war against communism, and that's where we are today, global war against Islamism. As much as the community might be looking for violence, they are contributing, just like fighting drunk driving. They would stop the guy and take away his keys, but they would probably hand him the substance, which is ideas that hate the West, ideas that blame the West, ideas that are conspiratorial, that are misogynistic. Those are all the underbelly of radicalization that most of our Islamic establishment are in denial that pushes them on the conveyor belt towards radicalization. And we Do you aren't think even just afraid? That. Yeah, let, let's, uh, let's accept the, the half full glass version of that story that, that uh, they don't want anything to do with this, but that they're afraid to, 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 to address the rogues in their midst. 
Neil, that's a cop-out. And I, I mean, maybe in Syria or in Egypt or Iraq or in Saudi Arabia where they get in prison for these kind of things, they'd be afraid. But listen, a counterterrorism center in Riyadh is a joke. It's a waste of time. We need to do this in the laboratory in America where we have the freedom to do these critical thinking, to counter our leadership, to fight the establishment, to say that they're afraid. Yeah, they might get pushed back. I've been, you know, attacked, uh, not physically, but ideologically in my mosque and elsewhere. But what happens? They then come to terms with critical thinking and respect those who have counter ideas and are trying to do it from a position of tough love. That's what we need to give our Muslim community, not apologetics and tell them, oh, we won't be bigots, but actually treat them as equals and tell them, you know what, are you a British citizen who wants to fight in our military or are you a jihadi possibly that believes in the global movement of political Islam, even if it's nonviolent, that you is a loyalty problem. You don't think a good many of them just keep to themselves, maybe for very valid reasons, language barriers and the rest, cultural and the rest, but that they're more inclined to stick to themselves and not share this sort of thing. Well, it's because we give them a pass. It's because they don't see the urgency. Nobody's telling them that, what is your legacy going to be? They say, oh, it's not my problem. I escaped that in the Middle East. Or actually, because of the coddling of political correctness, there's no stimulus for them to say, you know what? If we don't lead this battle of ideas and marginalize and, and counter the imams publicly, we're right. going to leave a legacy that Islam is incompatible with America, with Britain, and Western culture. All right, Zudi, thank you very much. Zudi Jassy, the American uh, Islamic Foreign thank Founder you. and President.